Hello and welcome to Void Electronics. In today's video we are trying out Jim Williams load slammer circuit. This is an active load capable of 100 amps that can be used for testing the transient response and the stability of voltage regulators. Before talking about this circuit I would like to talk about regulators in general and why you might want to check the stability of your regulator. After that I will analyze Jim Williams circuit and then we will perform some experiments to see this thing in action. So let's start. Since you clicked on this video I will assume that you are familiar with linear voltage regulators. Just like this classic LM7808 which is a positive regulator that produces 8 volts. This is so common that we can almost say that it grows on trees as we say here in Romania. And here's what a typical application for such an IC looks like. It just needs an input capacitor and an output capacitor according to the datasheet. And you probably know that these two capacitors are here for stability, better transient response and also to get rid of some high frequency noise. But I think it would be really nice to prove this in practice and this is where the active load comes in. So we will perform some experiments with this later in this video. And in order to understand what we are trying to do here today, I think it's really important to talk about the internal structure of such an IC. And it looks more or less like this. We have a power transistor between the input and the output, and this power transistor can be an NMOS, a PMOS, PNP or NPN transistor. In our case, it's a PMOS. We also need a reference, which is not drawn here. And then we have some extra circuitry that does some magic in order to keep the output voltage stable or at least to make it track the reference, so at best it can be as good as the reference is. Let's see how we can do that. Well, first of all let's assume that we have a 1 volt reference. We can use that reference at the input of an op-amp, and assuming that the op-amp has negative feedback, it will do its best to keep V plus and V minus equal. This means that for 1 volt here, the op-amp will do its best to keep 1 volt here. Well, let's see what we need to do in order for this to happen. Here we have our classic voltage divider, which was designed in such a way that for 8 volts here, we get 1 volt here. This is why we have 7k here and 1k here. So, assuming that the input voltage is large enough, the op-amp will drive this transistor with a VGS that will provide 8 volts at the output no matter what. And this forms what we call a feedback loop. So, assuming that we get an increased load, or maybe a variation at the input, the op-amp will do its best to keep the output stable, assuming that the reference is stable. Let's see how that works. Well, to prove that this circuit has negative feedback, we have to assume that there is some change in the circuit. For example, let's assume that for some reason V-out goes down like this on a pulse. Well, if that happens, a drop at the output produces a drop at the feedback voltage. So instead of 1 volt, it will be something less than that. If that happens, the op-amp is suddenly out of balance, so this voltage will be smaller than this voltage. Since the non-inverting input is smaller, this will cause the output to get smaller, which will cause the VGS on this PMOS to get smaller, and the lower VGS increases the drain current. And by increasing the drain current, we make the output higher. And the higher output, as you can see here, will cancel out our initial stimulus which means that we have negative feedback. Now, of course, this is an ideal feedback loop, and in practice, there are a million things that can go wrong with it. First of all, don't assume that the feedback loop's response is instantaneous. So if something happens to the output and something drags it down, it takes some time for the feedback loop to compensate for that and bring the output back to where it was. Once again, this behavior can be easily observed with an active load. Also, such a loop can become unstable. For example, if we have any sort of element that produces a phase shift, like inductors and capacitors here, that sounds like the perfect recipe for a phase shift oscillator. So if the conditions are just right or wrong actually, we can turn all this into an oscillator. That's why such feedback loops are always analyzed for stability and one way to do this is once again to use an active load and just slam the output with some fast current pulses. So let's see how we can do that. Well, for static loads, things are pretty easy. We can just use some sort of power resistor and this will load down the regulator so that we can see how it works with static loads. But what about load steps? Well, for load steps, we can use a MOSFET transistor to connect and disconnect the power resistor repeatedly. 
However, this has some limitations too. If we do that, the load current depends on the resistor, so it won't be easy to change. We, and we also won't have much control on the rise time, fall time and the waveform of the current. So this is where the active load comes in. Let's have a look at the schematic and study how it works. So the schematic comes from application note 133 by Jim Williams from Linear Technology. If this name doesn't ring a bell, well, Jim Williams was one of the greatest analog IC designers. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2011, so this must be one of his latest works, actually. Anyway, I highly recommend that you read the entire application note, because in this video I will only go through the main points. The basic concept of such a load is this one in figure 2. We have a power transistor, which is an NMOS, that draws some current from a voltage regulator. In order to monitor that current, we have a shunt, which is 1 milliohm in this case, and then we have some gate drive stage that takes an input voltage in order to drive the transistor. This way we have an input voltage that gets converted into a current, and then we also have an output voltage that is proportional to the load current. So let's take things a step further with the next figure. Figure 3 is something closer to the actual implementation of the circuit. Here we can see that we have an error amplifier which is A1 and once again assuming that it has negative feedback V plus equals V minus. And V plus is at ground here which means that the amplifier will do its best to keep this node at ground. Assuming that we have no input and we ignore this pot here, things are pretty easy, right? All the currents here are zero so the amplifier doesn't have much to do. So far so good. But let's see what happens with the negative input. Let's assume we have minus 1 volt here. Well, if we have minus 1 volt here, this node is at zero, so we have a current that goes out of this node and into the input basically. According to Kirchhoff's current law, that means that we need some input current into this node to keep it at zero volts. And that current can only come through this resistor, assuming that we once again ignore this pot here. And assuming that this resistor and this resistor are equal, that means that the amplifier will do its best to keep this node at positive 1 volt. Now looking at our 1 milliohm shunt here, if we have 1 volt across this shunt, that means that we have 1000 amps going through it. And those 1000 amps can only come from the transistor. Which implies that for our input, the error amplifier will apply whatever VGS is needed here, in order for the transistor to pull 1000 amps. And also to confirm that we have this output voltage here that is basically the voltage drop across the shunt. So we can monitor this externally using an oscilloscope for example. As you can see this application node has a really nice and gradual approach. So as you progress through the figures the circuit gets more and more complex and more and more close to reality. So in figure 4 we have some more detail about how you can make such a circuit. And it has some extra blocks as well. First of all, we have some capacitors here that are used to adjust the circuit's transient response. We have an intermediate stage between the error amplifier and the power transistor, which is probably used to drive the transistor faster than the op-amp can do on itself. We also have a dissipation limiter because under certain circumstances we could of course fry this power transistor if the power dissipation is too large for it. And we also have a differential shunt amplifier with a gain of 10 which allows us to keep a really small value for the shunt while also getting some significant voltage here that is proportional to the load current. And of course this amplified voltage goes back into the feedback loop. So the main concept stays the same. Also. Since these amplifiers have some offsets, the offsets can be compensated using this trim pot. And finally, this is the real schematic proposed by Jim Williams. Of course, the concept stays the same. Here we have the error amplifier, we have the dissipation limiter right here, we have the gate drive circuitry, which is built using discrete components in this case, we have the gate drive bias control, which is right here, the power transistor is right here, and this is the shunt amplifier. Now Jim Williams proposal here is to calibrate this circuit for 100 amps per volt, which means that for an input of minus 1 volt you get 100 amps of load current. And by trimming the gain of this shunt amplifier 
you can easily achieve that and you can also achieve an output voltage that has the same gain. So for one volt here you have 100 amps of load current. So this means that you can drive this circuit from a signal generator and you can also monitor the current on an oscilloscope. Which is really convenient because you don't have to mess with current probes and other things like that. Now the actual circuit that we will use today is an improved version of this circuit designed by my friend from Gears and Gear. Who also runs an electronics YouTube channel by the way, which you'll find in the description of this video. Let's have a look at his schematic too. Once again the concept is the same. This is the error amplifier. The gate driver was replaced by a single IC which makes things a lot easier. We have the shunt amplifier here. The dissipation limiter was removed. And also in order to power this up from some stable voltages we have two linear voltage regulators that provide plus 5 volts and minus 5 volts. We just have to provide plus and minus 15 volts for this to work. As you can see these larger voltages are used to power the error amplifier and the gate driver and that's because the MOSFET needs some significant VGS voltages in order to provide such high currents. These voltages could very well exceed 5 volts. So enough theory I guess, let's just have a look at this circuit in practice. For the first experiment I will demonstrate the transient response of this 7809 in a configuration that is not recommended by the datasheet. More specifically I remove the input capacitor and the output capacitor. To do this we have these two power supplies providing the power for the active load. We also have this power supply providing power for the regulator. Then we have this signal generator producing some really short pulses here. As you can see the duty cycle is 0.05% at 100 Hz. And of course we have to use the oscilloscope to monitor this circuit's response. So let's give it a try and hope that nothing blows up. The regulator is on, let's turn on the signal generator as well. Ok, we see the transient response here, let's try single sweep. Turn it off. And then we can have a look at it. Apparently, the transient response is pretty strange without the output capacitor. The active load is able to drag the output all the way down to zero and then we can see that the regulator recovers back to the nominal voltage. So let's see if the transient response gets better with an output capacitor. Now we have 820 nanofarads at the output so let's try again. The power is on, the regulator works, let's turn on the signal generator and as you can see it is much better. So we definitely have an undershoot here, however the circuit is recovering pretty fast and the output goes nowhere near zero under these conditions. So far we were able to demonstrate the importance of the output capacitor, however remember when I said that this load goes all the way up to 100 amps? Well let's replace this 1.5 amp regulator with something beefier. So in order to test the active load all the way up to 100 amps we have to change the device under test. And the perfect device under test for this is this eval board by Infineon. This is actually a 1 volt 30 amp buck converter. In order to minimize inductance, the active load was soldered directly onto the board between the output and ground. The setup is otherwise almost the same. I reconfigured the signal generator to produce 1 volt pulses and let's see how this circuit behaves. First of all let's turn it on. Ok, the regulator is on and now we can turn on the signal generator as well. And it looks really nice. So as you can see we can observe the transient response of this feedback loop. We have an undershoot but the back converter recovers from it. So just to give you an overview here, channel 1 which is the yellow trace is the output of the shunt amplifier. And the active load was calibrated for 100 amps per volt for both the input and the output. And as you can see the pulse exceeds 1 volt which means that we are pulling a little bit over 100 amps out of the regulator for a short period of time. Channel 2 or the violet trace is the output of the signal generator and channel 3 or the blue trace is the output voltage of the buck converter. 
Now let's see if we can take the back converter into a fault condition. I will do this by increasing the pulse width. So let's go to something that is 10 times larger, 0.5%. And yeah, this definitely disables the regulator for a while. It's hard to see, but let's try a single sweep. And as you can see, the output goes all the way down to zero. Let's change the time base here so we can see what's going on. Okay, this is still hard to see. And I think this is better. Let's try single sweep. And now you can see what's going on. So the active load pulls the regulator all the way down to zero. Then it takes some time for it to recover. And after it recovers, the cycle continues once again. This is a really aggressive test. So if the back converter survives this test without massive overshoot or oscillations or weird things like that, then I think that we can safely assume that this would work really nicely in an application. In this particular case, this back converter is designed to power processors, which can actually cause load steps by switching from an inactive state to an active state. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're interested in more content related to electronics and programming, please subscribe or follow this account because there is more content like this on the way. That's it for now. Bye.